We're continuing today in our series through the Beatitudes, so do keep that passage open. Uh, this is a collection of sayings from Jesus about what the blessed life, the, the happy life, looks like. Forget British values, these are the original kingdom virtues. He's saying them primarily to his disciples, but as we see later, there's actually a whole mountain listening in, uh, hanging on his every word. Um, and if you were here last week, you'll have heard Rob really helpfully put it that these beatitudes, these sayings, they're a package deal. They're not like a tub of celebrations where you can take all the Twixes and run or leave the bounties to the end. Uh, whatever your preference is, I don't know, maybe you love coconut. You can't pick and choose. These are all the virtues that characterize all Christians. They begin with how we come to God. If you see that in weakness and humility, mourning our sin, expressing our longing for righteousness, and, and God's response will be to let us into his kingdom, to comfort us and to fill us. Then last week we were challenged by how, as God shows us mercy and chooses not to give us what we deserve, we might let mercy flow out from us uh, and give to others what they don't deserve from us. And this week, well, this week we move from the challenging to the downright remarkable. As Jesus says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. I wonder how you feel hearing those words, blessed are the pure of heart. Some of you might be thinking we could all be doing with a bit more of that in our world at the moment, uh, with everything that's going on. I suspect a number of us are already hearing those words and thinking, oh crikey, that's not me, count me out. Well, join the club, uh, I should say. Let me stop your insecurities right there. Jesus knows. He knows we're not perfect, just like he knew his disciples weren't perfect. He loves us anyway. This is a package deal. Verse 8, Christians here, they're already loved, forgiven, filled, comforted. Uh, this standard, it's not been set to beat ourselves up with, but to long for the day when we might live it out. And that might be an uncomfortable process, uh, examining our hearts, it often is. But there's no call for despair in these verses. In Christ, we have everything we need. Uh, and if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian today and you're just looking in, well, this is a great place to start. And Matthew 5 is an excellent place to start. Uh, if what you're hearing today makes sense, or, or even if particularly if it doesn't make sense, um, and you're, you want to know more, then please do ask your questions after the service. Uh, if you feel comfortable to do that, we would love to answer them. Equally, we're here every week and we're working through Matthew 5 for at least a couple more. So you're super welcome to come back again and hear more if you'd like to. Uh, with that said, let me pray and we'll get into it. Uh, Lord God, thank you for these words of Jesus. Thank you that we have this morning to reflect on them in our hearts and minds. I pray that you'd help us to do that well and that we come away from this morning desiring you more. Amen. So first up, blessed are the pure in heart. The heart here, just so that we're all on the same page, is not the organ that pumps blood around the body. This is not a call to perfect cardio, at least I hope not. Um, the heart here is the core of who we are. Uh, when I ask, who are you at heart? I mean, what, what drives you? What do you long for? What are your desires, your ambitions, your loves, your hopes, your dreams? When everything else material is stripped away, what are you about? And what do you care about? And purity is freedom from contamination. Think about bottled water, the way they brand it straight from the source. Ah, crystal brooks and bubbling streams. Yes, that's pure. And nothing else in there but water, my friend. Drink it up. So purity of the heart then is a person whose desires, their thoughts, their hopes, their dreams are uncontaminated. They are all about one thing. They are single-minded. Now, if you've been watching the Olympics, you'll know what single-mindedness looks like. Uh, those of you who know me well won't be surprised to hear that I use the Olympics as another excuse to watch more tennis. And last Sunday, this man, Novak Djokovic, finally won his long sought after gold medal, completing his aim of winning literally everything tennis has to offer. Djokovic. He's a pretty great example of single-mindedness. 
everything he is and does is about him winning more at tennis. After that final, he said something really interesting. He said that he put his heart, his soul, his body, his family, his everything into winning that match. And if your ears pricked up at the way he phrased that, it might be because Jesus has something very similar to say, but with a very different object in mind. And later in Matthew, Jesus is getting grilled by some religious leaders. They want to catch him out, so they ask him, what's the greatest commandment then? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. See, none of us were made for tennis, though it sometimes feels like Djokovic was genetically engineered. Tennis did not make us. Tennis is not the centre of the universe. Tennis does not deserve to be the sole focus of our heart's desires, our wills and our minds. Anna, did you get that? I'm just checking that my wife, she'll quote this back to me when the US Open comes around. <laughs> Tennis, it can be a, a small g God in our lives, but it cannot be God. God, on the other hand, can be and is in fact God. If, as the Bible claims, there is one being outside of space and time who is absolutely perfect and good, and if that one being made us and made everything, but in particular made you and me, in his image, to know him and to represent him on earth, if that's true, then he is absolutely deserving of all of our heart's attention. And I think this is really good news. Um, I'm going to butcher the name, but Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, in his delightfully helpful book, Purity of the Heart is to Will One Thing, he says this. Only the eternal is always appropriate and always present, is always true. Only the eternal applies to each human being, whatever his age may be. Now that's an existential quote if I've ever heard one. Let me try and break it down. If everything is temporary, then nothing is of ultimate value. Or just as bad, if something was of ultimate value, but was temporary, then only some people at some point in history would get to be fully human, depending on their access to it. I, I got a shirt, um, I turned 30 this year, and I got a shirt from my colleagues that said, awesome since May 94, which I really like, it's a good shirt. Um, so, and you can't argue with what's written on a shirt, it's the, the law. So I've been awesome since May 94, and if I'm lucky, I might get to be awesome for another 50 or 60 years. Um, but that's no use to someone in Morocco in 1504. Um, they don't get to know me. Uh, and it doesn't help anyone in SpaceX Colony 5 in the year 25780. They also do not get to know me. Um, and that's probably a good thing. I shouldn't have such a high value of my own importance. Um, but that is the case with everything we hope for on Earth. It, none of it is eternal. It might not feel like it right now, but it is all temporary. It will not last. But God is eternal in every age and at every moment. And for everyone, he is the same God, absolutely good and worthy of our single minded devotion. So if that's the ideal, that's the ideal Jesus is calling his people to here, um, a pure heart. If that's the case, I think there are two other options. Uh, one is to have an evil heart and the other is to have a divided heart. Uh, the first is to have an evil heart. Um, the Bible has a lot to say about the human heart, as it turns out. And to be honest, it's, it's mostly bad. Uh, Adam and Eve could have been pure of heart, but chose to disobey him. And so by Genesis 5, not like four pages in, uh, we read about their descendants that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were only evil all the time. You can't get much worse than that. You fast forward a couple thousand years, maybe we've improved. No, we have not. Jeremiah speaking to the people of his day, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. And even in this sermon, as in, in Jesus' sermon on the mount, not my sermon, he says to his disciples and the crowds listening in, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven, though you are evil, that's a striking thing. 
to say to the people on the mountain with you. But this has been the story throughout history. And if we fast forward to today, uh, it's still no better. The default state of the human heart is not purity, quite the reverse. Uh, none of us are the Novak Djokovic of seeking God. Um, if anything, we're all the Novak Djokovic of putting ourselves first. Uh, if living whether quietly or obnoxiously as though we are the most important thing that there is. Seeking our kingdom, as it were, and giving our lives to things to the extent that we think they might bring us wealth or happiness or fulfillment. And a quick read through the rest of Matthew uh, would be enough to see that, I think. But if you've got Matthew 5 still open, have a look down with me. Um, look at some of the standards Jesus sets for our hearts. I imagine it a bit like Detective Columbo working through a case. I won't do the accent, it will be bad. But verse 21, for example, in chapter 5. Okay, so you haven't murdered. Let me just ask this. Do you carry hate and anger in your heart? Is your desire to take vengeance rather than love? Verse 27, you've managed not to be unfaithful. That's great. Not everyone manages that. Just one more thing, though. It's hot this summer. There's a lot of attractive people around wearing less than usual. Have you noticed that? Is your heart longing for them just a little bit? Maybe a lot? Verse 33, so you don't swear oaths to God. You don't promise big grand things, but at heart... Do you often find yourself trusting in yourself more than God? Verse 43, you're good to the people you like. That's good. But at heart, though, is that because they like you back? If your heart was after God, you'd love even the people who want the worst for you. They're made in his image as well. Um, verse Chapter 6, verses 2 and 5. Wow, you give and pray. That's really good. Those are great things to do. But in your heart... Is that because you love God and want to glorify him? Or would you like people to notice and respect you for it? They're punchy verses, aren't they? In other words, do we do good because of compliance? Because we'll get into trouble if we don't, or because it helps us advance our goals, or because it will make people like and respect us? Or do we do good because the natural inclination of our hearts is to seek God and he is good? Like we don't even have to think about it because we're so drawn to him that Goodness is the only choice we can see. Well, if you think about it that way, you can see why Jesus was so opposed to the Pharisees, the priests of their day. They worked really hard to look really good. They talked the religious talk. They walked the religious walk. But when Jesus came and showed them time and time again that he was God, they rejected him because in their hearts, it wasn't God they were seeking. Later in Matthew, he calls them whitewashed tombs. They've worked hard to look good on the outside, but inside they are spiritually dead. But we can't single them out to feel better about ourselves. The biblical reality is that this is all of us without God's intervention, spiritually dead, in need of a spiritual heart transplant, which is why alongside these indictments of the heart in the Bible, we also get calls for God's help. And David cries out in Psalm 51 after his adultery, God, put a heart in me, a pure heart. I can't do it myself. And in Ezekiel 36, God sees the need of the people and he promises, I will remove the hearts of stone from you and put in the hearts of flesh. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 2, looking back, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. The blessed life in Matthew 5 belongs to those who understand their lack of goodness before God and are humble enough to ask for help. Friends, if you know you're not good, but you're feeling like maybe I can do better, I'll give it another go first. I need to shape up a bit before I come to God. Let me plead with you. That is a pipe dream. You cannot make yourself spiritually alive by your own strength. If we believe what the Bible says about the heart, then relying on God to save and change us is the only rational response that we have. Every other choice gets us nowhere. Now, many of us here do know this and have asked God to save them and do now have hearts that want to seek him 
and his kingdom first. And yet, I'm sure that those two are reading Matthew 5, listening to Jesus' Columbo moment, and it's hitting pretty hard. Part of me wants to seek God, you say, but I can't lie, part of me wants to do all those other things too. And this is where the Christian finds himself, longing for a pure heart, but wrestling with a divided heart. Or biblically, I think, a double-minded heart. Um, I was going to say earlier we saw Psalm 24 read out, but that would have required me to ask Marina to do that. Sorry, Marina. Um, so we're just going to put that up on the screen. Um, Psalm 24 says this. Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Are the Israelites who this is being, who are speaking this, they're constantly turning to other gods setting up altars to them and worshipping them alongside the Lord. The Lord was their God, yes, but so were all these other gods. Their hearts were drawn to them. They wanted to choose both. So their allegiance was divided. And James, the brother of Jesus, I reckon he must be looking back on this psalm in his letter when he writes to the Christians of his day. His readers are longing for things in this world. Those things are wrestling for priority with God in their hearts. So he warns them, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. I don't know how many of you have seen New Girl, but in my head, this is the Nick Miller verse. You get one life, you have to choose. It's the way the world works. Uh, so in verse 8, James calls them to repent. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded. Christians, says James, often find themselves double-minded. Fundamentally, we desire God because we have a new heart, but we're still carrying the baggage of our old selves. It's a new heart in the old body. This can divide us and lead to a lot of pain and frustration. The answer to it, James says, is to draw near to the one who saved you and wants to know you. And in doing so, let go of those other desires. We rewatched the Toy Story movies on our holiday um, while we were in the Lake District because you don't need kids to love Pixar. And frankly, they're all masterpieces, <laughs> except for three. Don't watch three. But four, Toy Story 4, my goodness, if that's passed you by, absolute certified masterpiece. And there's a character in Toy Story 4 called Forky, who you think is going to be annoying, but is honestly the emotional heavyweight of this movie. His form, his body, is trash. But that trash has been remade by a little girl as a toy. And for a while, his impulses are driving him to seek the comfort of being trash. He's literally getting in the bin. And so Woody has to keep diving into the bin and rescuing him from it. Eventually, in the movie, Woody gets through to him. And he realises it's not about what he's made from, it's now who he's made for. And from that moment on, he's living all out to be her toy. Drawing near to her, enjoying the close relationship, the fulfilment that comes from being hers. It's, that's driven out all the thoughts of diving into trash cans. He's enjoying a higher level of meaning than he ever was before. <coughs> Can you see how if you've been saved, not just by God, but for God, that this is the blessed life? Devotion to God, it comes out in how we live, sure, but it starts with loving and knowing him and being known by him. So if you find yourself a bit miserable in the Christian life, doing all the right things, you think, but feeling unfulfilled and distant from God, it might be because your heart's not relating to him well, loving him, right? There might be other things you're longing for that he's beginning to feel a bit like a barrier to. I don't know what that might be for you. Maybe it's an experience, a relationship, might be an extension on the house, I don't know. What do you find yourself dreaming about when you go to sleep or worrying about when you wake up? How is God better, more worthy than those things? Spend some time getting to know him, praying to him and find out. Before we continue couple other things to note. A lot of people and cultures view purity as an external thing, right? Washing, cleansing, living, behaving a certain way. 
do that and you'll be acceptable to God. I hope you can see that what the Bible says is not this. Rather, Jesus says purity is on the inside. What comes out is determined by what's already in. If that's true, there's a couple of things I think that should be noted. One, external controls on sin, they can't replace heart change. So there are good things we can rightly do to reduce the triggers for temptation. So if we struggle with alcoholism, sensible decisions about what drinks are in the house, and when you leave the office, they can make it easy to avoid triggers. Our accountability software on phones and laptops can make it harder to seek out and watch pornography. Fish sticks is a great replacement for other words that you could say in frustration. Those can be super helpful. <laughs> you might have better ones, I don't know. Those can be super helpful in the short term and limit uh, the impact of our heart's ability to cause sin. But if those desires that, right, that are in us never change, they'll become legalism. They'll become chains that we rail against, limits we want to break because we want to. And following on from that, secondly, controlling the behaviour of others is also not heart change. Uh, this one is mainly, I think, for the parents, but also anyone that we're mentoring or looking out for. Uh, Hannah's cousin was over visiting recently from the States. And at one point they were having a really interesting discussion about what I would call the purity culture that they grew up in. Ensuring that they waited for marriage to have sex was a primary concern of their communities. And although a few people tried to engage their hearts, what they were feeling, most were defaulting to other options. You know, abstinence clubs, purity rings, a lot of scaring them about the consequences, a lot of shaming them for the way they spoke to boys and dressed. And you'll be shocked to hear that largely didn't work. It led to a lot of hurt and resentment, and it massively complicated the way they felt about themselves and about others. Trying to make people look or talk or act a certain way without them wanting to, it might look respectable, but it won't work. We'll need to weigh up. <coughs> Is this a moral issue or just the way I seem to want them to be? And if it is a moral issue, we need to show them Christ. Model a genuine relationship with God to them and, and pray desperately as a church that God would change them. <coughs> However you slice it, as people who've been designed and then saved for a relationship with God, it's worth seeking him with our whole hearts. Now, that might be something we can talk about after church and when we see each other in the week. How's your heart? What's going on internally that I can be praying for? As we do that, we can encourage each other that the pure of heart will see God. They will see God. What does that mean? Great question. Anyone who's spoken to me about this talk recently would have heard me complain that all the commentaries and talks on this verse, they say a lot about the heart and a very little about saying that's seeing God. And I'm now a massive hypocrite because there's five minutes left. Um, but we'll do what we can and we can discuss the rest after. Uh, let's go back to Psalm 24 a moment. Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. In other words, who can go up and be where God is? Who can stand in his holy place, that is, in his complete unfiltered presence? Um, in the Old Testament, basically no one could do this. They weren't holy, they would get burned up by his presence if they tried. It's like darkness trying to move into light. It, it can't. If it tried, it would cease to exist. And so to prevent all of us ceasing to exist, in various ways God has limited his presence on earth so that people can see some of him but not too much of him. In dreams, through angels, as a burning bush. The closest to really seeing God, I think, is Moses in Exodus chapter 33. He gets to see the reflection of his back while Moses hides in a cave on the side of a mountain. And even that is almost too much for him. And then in Jesus, God comes down as a person. The invisible God made visible. In Jesus, we get to see most clearly what God is like. His character, his power... Those who didn't want to know God, they didn't see him. They didn't recognise him, even as he was doing miracles right in front of their eyes. But those who realised they needed God, they saw him for who he was. And as he changed them and they sought God more, they saw him more clearly. 
and they realized they needed to change more and then they and so on it went and as our hearts seek to know god more we'll both begin to see him in the world and also to see the world as he sees it uh, we start by sorry we started today by singing be thou my vision o lord of my heart and what a great prayer that as we seek God, we would get to see him rightly and that we would see God in everything we look at, like a filter on the world that allows us to see his power working in difficult situations, his love for our friends and colleagues, his glory in nature. How is God looking at what I'm seeing right now? And how is God in what I'm seeing right now? Those would be fascinating questions to ask yourself during the week. I've lost my last page. That's not good. I'm going to nick it from you guys. Thank you. Always happens. There we go. Ultimately, though, to ascend the mountain of the Lord and be in his presence is to see him in heaven, where he is totally himself. To gaze directly into the furnace of his holiness without being burned. And not just to see like to look at, to see like I'll see you next Tuesday. That is to spend time with and get to know him. Like Adam and Eve walking and talking with God in the Garden of Eden. And those are things we can't do fully until he returns. The great hope of the Christian life is to one day see God face to face and be with him forever. This is the hope John writes of when he says, But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. There will be lots of amazing things about heaven, uh, not just not least the fact that everyone will be like Christ in purity. I mean, imagine a world where everyone always wants to do good. What a utopia that would be. But the most amazing thing will be that the God we've been seeking to get to know our whole lives, we will see him perfectly. The great desire of our hearts, the one we're made to know. We won't be held back by life or double-mindedness or anything. Imagine knowing exactly what you're meant to be doing and then being able to do it perfectly for the rest of time. Imagine knowing exactly who you want to spend time with and being able to spend time with them for the rest of time. Well, that's a really awesome hope. In a minute, we'll sing about that hope. Uh, which always seems like a great way to end things, but particularly this week. But first, why don't I pray that this hope and this life might be the one we desire more strongly in the coming weeks. Father, thank you for showing us who you are in Jesus. Thank you that those who trust in him will one day see you face to face perfectly. Whatever you've revealed to us about our hearts this morning, Lord, I pray that it would encourage each of us to draw nearer to you and that as we do so, you would reveal more of yourself to us. Help us to be honest with each other about what's in our hearts and to encourage each other to live single-mindedly for you. Our Lord, you are worthy of all our devotion. Help us to see that and to live that daily. In Jesus' name, amen.